Hello, Francis. Is it okay if I call you Francis? The counselor asked. I told her that was fine. Then you can call me Valerie or Val, she commented as she led me towards her office. I know most of my clients aren't even comfortable even being here anymore, so why make it worse with ceremonies? She opened the door. Carol is here waiting for us. I gulped as Carol, my beautiful wife, for the moment, stood up to greet me. Hello, Francis, she said softly. You look well. I looked at her more closely. So do you, I lied. She stood there hesitantly, waiting for something. Val watched her, wondering what it could be. Then I noticed the longing in Carol's eyes. I realized what she wanted. I opened my arms and she stepped toward me for a hug. She seemed familiar but different at the same time. She had definitely lost weight since I moved in with my brother last month, the day before Valentine's Day. That was the day I found out she'd been cheating on me for four years. Val coughed discreetly, and my wife reluctantly let go of me and returned to her chair. Val took her seat and invited me to take mine, so we formed a nice equilateral triangle, each facing the other two. Val began. Let's first understand why we're all gathered here, she suggested. I'll start. I'm only here as a facilitator to make sure you both get the most out of this session. After that, you can decide if you want to continue separately, together, or both. She leaned forward for emphasis. I'm not here to judge or pass judgment, she reminded us. I can ask questions, but only the two of you have the answers. My role is to guide you to them. She sat back down. So, Francis, why are you here? What do you want out of this session? I wondered that question myself. I was as honest as I could be. I'm here because my wife has agreed to accept the financial breakup terms I've offered if I agree to attend this session. I paused. I want to understand how I failed as a husband and drove my wife into bed with another man. Val nodded and made a note in her notebook. Carol? My wife blew her nose and looked at me with eyes full of tears. I'm here to assure my husband that these are my mistakes, not his. What I want doesn't matter because it can't be. Val frowned and was about to contradict my wife, but stopped, made a note, and turned to Carol again. Keep in mind that all I know is that your husband initiated the divorce. You are telling me that you are to blame, so lest I make unfair assumptions, why don't you explain the circumstances? With a hesitant glance at me, Carol began. To her credit, what she told Val was the truth, the whole truth. Four years ago, she had attended an annual conference on property management, in her case university real estate, and an old friend of hers from her student days was also a delegate. They'd spent the evening reminiscing and catching up, and the rest of the night revisiting their brief physical relationship. If it had been a one-off affair, I would never have known. But it seems to have continued over the next two events, and would have continued this year if I hadn't loved her too much. A careless remark by the receptionist at the restaurant when I was making arrangements to send Carol roses as a token of love on our first Valentine's Day apart revealed her infidelity. When I met with her the day before she was due to leave for this year's event, she confessed everything, saying it was the last time, as her lover's partner was pregnant, and we were going to start a family of our own, five lives ruined by a handful of catching up lovers. She finished her story and sat in silence while we watched Val finish taking notes. Carol noticed me glance at her and muttered, I'm so sorry. I nodded. I was sorry, too. I thought we had something special. Val seemed to think for a moment. Carol, she said softly, can you explain what you were thinking when you went from just greeting an old friend to actually sleeping with him? My wife looked at me nervously. I thought a lot about my behavior and, for my husband's benefit, I decided to explain it this way. There was a personal inertia that led to an interpersonal reaction with a low activation energy catalyzed by the presence of ethanol. Val looked at me to see if I found Carol's explanation as puzzling as she did. I considered what she meant. I nodded approvingly. A well-crafted resume, I agreed. That's when Val stepped into the conversation. At the risk of sounding silly or frivolous, could someone rearrange those words so they make sense? Carol looked at me, but I shook my head. No, it's your analogy. You explain it. She took a deep breath and began. Craig and I had been part of the same circle of friends for over a year. 
Sometimes on weekends, we were the only ones. We'd go out, a few times we even slept together. We were never exclusive, we weren't even a couple per se, so we never broke up. Our relationships, whatever they were. She paused and smiled sadly. Well, they never ended. We just lost touch. She wiped her eyes and continued more forcefully. I'm not excusing my behavior, it was wrong, but it was inertia. When Craig and I were alone away from home as students, we were close enough to keep each other company. We were safe, comfortable, and just like at university, there at the hotel, we did what we usually did when it was just the two of us. We hung out. She twirled the rings on her hand, just like when I'd confronted her. I took mine off as soon as I realized I'd been betrayed. I wonder if she noticed that, Carol continued. As for the next part, I'll explain it this way. Imagine Alice and Bob. I almost laughed out loud. So she was listening when I tried to explain quantum cryptography. Alice and Bob were the personifications we used when we were discussing the transmission of a secret message. She noticed my expression and smiled crookedly. Yeah, I was listening. Anyway, she continued for Val's benefit. Suppose Alice had a big fight with her partner Bob, or maybe he's selfish, or maybe he's boring in bed. That's when she decides to cheat. She buys sexy lingerie. She looks for men who are attracted to her. She makes it clear that she is available for them. They need time and space. They need to be discreet. Val didn't seem to understand anything. Carol continued, so it's a big investment of time and energy, and it involves risk. At any moment, Alice might think, is it worth it? But I, in her shoes, had no incentive to do anything like that. Francis and I were really happy, but that's where the alcohol came in. Craig and I had already had casual intimacy. There was no deliberate preparation, no huge leap to go from companionship to sex. That emotional threshold was crossed years ago. She shook her head sorrowfully. Alcohol served as a catalyst and further weakened that barrier. Activation energy, Val suggested. Exactly, my wife agreed. Some reactions require tremendous energy to trigger. But if you have a gas leak, even a tiny spark of static electricity could cause an explosion that would destroy your entire house. That's what we had after an evening spent in a pub. So, in the presence of alcohol, your past relationship with your old university friend had such a low emotional threshold that you shifted to habitual behavior with virtually no additional emotional effort. Val summarized. Yes, Carol acknowledged. The situation was familiar, and without thinking of the consequences, we behaved as we always have. That's why it affected me and not Francis. She turned to me. That's why I asked you to come for this one time. I needed you to hear that what I did was entirely due to my shortcomings, not yours. But you went on with your life, remarked Val. Carried on, my wife admitted. Not that first time the second night we spent apart. But yes, a year later, the same thing happened. We got together, and I spent the night with Craig because I could. That became, apparently, what we did. It was like every time we met, our paths changed. Carol studied me, trying to see if I understood. I've had a lot of time to think, she explained. So I decided to try to explain my behavior in less emotional language. I pondered her words. So when you and Craig met that first time, you each had a different trajectory, but your history together set you on a new path. Newton's second law. Exactly. And after that, you followed your new direction whenever you were together. Yes. She sighed heavily and tried to continue. Last year, we shared a room. But this year, although we intended to sleep together again, we agreed that it would be the last time. You weren't worried about pregnancy, S-T-I-S, Val asked. No, Carol was adamant. I was on the pill, but we still used condoms. I'm not a good judge of morality, of course, but even I wouldn't go back to my husband with another man's fluids inside me. Did you ever wonder, I asked, why he had condoms on hand? Well, no, she admitted. It was just bad luck, she added bitterly. God knows if Craig hadn't had them, we wouldn't have had sex. I'm guessing they were in his overnight travel bag with Jenna. Jenna checked his bag when I called her, just like I checked yours. 
She found a box of 12 condoms in his laundry bag. Carol lowered her eyes bashfully. I wasn't finished. There was a check in the box. It was dated January of this year. I paused, along with eight condoms. Carol immediately understood the implication and nodded sadly. So I'm not just a slut, I'm a gullible slut. She leaned back in her chair, staring up at the ceiling. She was silent now. I was amazed as she tried to explain the apparent ease with which she had slept with another man. Was it just an excuse? I admit I wanted to understand, and any explanation would have sounded like self-justification. To be honest, there was regret in her voice, and she freely admitted her guilt. Obviously, she was also well prepared. Using Newton's first and second laws was a clever metaphor. Unfortunately, the third law also played a part. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Carol's attraction to Craig had a repulsive effect. Valerie turned to me. Well, Francis, first of all, do you accept Carol's story as honest? I admitted that I did. Without requiring you to endorse her behavior, do you see a significant difference between a spouse going off in search of sexual adventure and two people resuming a relationship that never formally ended? I really had to think about this question. Let me rephrase that, Val suggested. Have you heard anything that would lead you to believe that what your husband could or should have done would have changed what Carol did? Both women sat in silence while I pondered. That fateful day, I checked the bag she had already packed for the conference. Her casual clothes and underwear were in there. She hadn't taken anything for Craig that she wouldn't wear for me. Moreover, there were still some rather flimsy pieces of underwear in her bedroom drawers. Her affair, whatever it was, seemed more like a casual and tawdry affair than a wild, erotic adventure. Our sex life experienced no peaks and troughs as the conference approached. And my wife seemed content with our lovemaking, suggesting but not demanding that I push the boundaries if I wanted to. I was enjoying her pleasure as much as she was enjoying mine, and neither of us was denying the other anything. I looked up. No, I answered Val's question. I believe Carol did what she did for her own reasons, independent of me. When we started, Val said, I asked you what you wanted. You said you wanted to find out how you failed as a husband. She paused to let that reminder sink in. Do you still believe you failed? I shook my head. What had happened was a consequence of the past that I had nothing to do with. Carol should have recognized the danger and avoided the situation, but she hadn't. It was her fault. No. Without knowing or understanding their relationship, there was nothing I could have done, I admitted. Val turned to face my wife. Carol, your goal was to convince your husband that it wasn't his blunders that drove you away. You heard his response. Are you satisfied that you accomplished that goal? Yes, she whispered. Val looked at her notes. You also said that what you wanted didn't matter. Why? Carol looked at me sadly. Because my husband is a reasonable man and will listen carefully to the advice of people he respects. One person in particular has already made a comment that applies in this case. She turned to face Valerie to answer her question. I want my husband to take me back, but as much as I want him to, his hero, Albert Einstein, has made it clear that he shouldn't. Again, Val looked puzzled. And again, I thought I understood. Carol blew her nose quietly and, looking at me through red-rimmed eyes, explained for the counselor. Although some people doubt that these are actually his words, Einstein supposedly said, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. She shrugged helplessly. With advice like that from a man he truly admires, why would Francis even give me another chance? 